Jesus Christ, man, I just walloped myself in the head with the uh, headphones. With the headphones? With the, yeah, with the over ears. I just banged myself like straight in the uh, temple. Okay, uh, let me put my earrings back in. Hold on. So, uh, first things first, merchandise. I want to talk merchandise, if that's okay with you, Bill. Oh, yes. Oh, and we haven't discussed this off air, actually, which is perhaps an error on my part. We should have discussed it off air first. But hey, we're here now. We may as well put it on air. Um, so do you remember I was saying ages ago that we're, we're looking, we would like to do merch someday and that Patreon yeah. was gearing itself up to incorporate merch in its platform? And I was going to kind mm-hmm. of wait for that because it would be like a one solution for everything sort of job. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so what's happened is uh, Patreon has launched that, but like they've created a separate like tier, like a, a, almost like a, a pro uh, patronage um, thing, um, which creators can go for, and that would include merchandise, but which means that, that they take a bigger cut of what you make on Patreon. And whilst I don't think that that's like um, a bad call on their part or anything, I just don't really want to do that. Uh, and I don't think uh, I'm in a fa- financial position to try and give over, over more uh, cash to other company to to another company. Mm. So given that that no longer is an option, at least in my mind, uh, I think now uh, my, our hand has been forced and we should just go the sort of like Teespring sort of route and make some uh, T-shirts uh, that way. If you're if you're happy with this, uh, I'm going to make that my little project. And then I suppose the listeners... Uh, you there may be some artifacts in coat of arm t-shirts maybe next month uh, that you could purchase if you so please uh, what are your thoughts on that bill I mean I'd have to look into the specifics of it but yeah the the idea that you've to it's it's like a meta patreon like you've to subscribe to a the, the, the content creator has to subscribe to a better patreon service in order to access the rewards of having merchandise. Yeah. Is that yeah. what it's... Yeah, it's like it's like a yeah, like a pro, just a pro version of a page. I think they even call it like the professional uh, thing. Um, yeah. Which again, mm. which again is totally fine. It just doesn't, I don't think it suits uh, certainly my business model and I don't think the business model of this, of this podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th- I think a Teespring kind of situation seems a little bit more viable. And what I'm noticing as well, more and more, is that creators seem to be uh, putting... There seems to be Teespring and YouTube integ- integration as well. And, like, below certain videos, you'll see, like, a, a line of, like, shirts or whatever that you can, like, click on and buy. And there's, like, mm-hmm. that's all done through Teespring. Uh, and whilst I find that a little bit kind of garish, it seems to be a thing that, in general, people are kind of gravitating towards as a sort of merchandise solution. So... If we do Teespring for the podcast, then it kind of would make sense that that Teespring would also show up for uh, the main channel. So it makes sense to do the Teespring here, I think. So anyway, just heads up for uh, for for viewers, uh, potential coat of arms. Uh, I'm assuming t-shirts uh, on the way. Super. Super. All right. Uh, so that that's very exciting. Really, really quick bit of a uh, bit of like public service nothing there. Let's do some follow up. Uh, do you want to do some emails first, Bill? Uh, why not? Why not? Sure. If we're here, we may as well. <laughs> if we're here, um. So first of all, we've got an email from Wingless Seraph. Hmm. Um. Who just wants to say, firstly, thank you so much for continuing the show. And they, they've world built for de-stress for many years. And some videos from the main channel were their first introduction to linguistics. And now they're about to start writing their thesis on Chinese linguistics. So that's pretty cool. Do you know what? Um, they're, they're not the first person. It, and it never seems to go the other way. It never seems to be anyone being all like, I was never into geography. But then your videos made me want to get into like, you know, uh, physical science or whatever. Um, it's always a linguistics thing. And there's been a couple of people who are all like, I'm doing a thesis now. And it's just, it, it's bonkers. It's bonkers to think that this happens, that you have this like reach. It's crazy. Well, linguistics is cool as heck. It is cool as heck. That, that, is, that is entirely accurate. 
Um, so they've got a couple of questions here. The first one is, have you considered or come across any conlangs using a logographic writing system? If so, how do these conlangs go about constructing characters? Uh, Chinese characters uses a system of radicals, so an individual character is normally made up of several components. Um, I just think this is an interesting concept to explore and haven't seen it done very much, probably because it's extremely time consuming. And on a side note to that, uh, they reckon conlang isn't something that exists in Chinese, that there aren't constructed languages in Chinese media, um, mm. or those that do exist aren't fleshed out at all. Uh, that's a, That secondary point is interesting. I wonder, could anyone enlighten us any further on that? Is is conlanging a thing within uh, Chinese speculative fictions? I, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd broad that out a bit. Like, is it a thing within, like, any non-Anglophone uh, speculative fictions, like India, you know, Brazil, all that sort of thing? Because the only, the mm-hmm. only conlangs I know of are from uh, people who speak English. Well, Esperanto is... I, th- I don't think the guy who made Esperanto was originally an English speaker. Sure, but I was thinking more like Tolkien sort of thing. like Con- Yeah, like one, ones for fiction rather than Bingo. auxiliary languages. Bingo. And, and yeah, I can't yeah. think of anyone that doesn't come out of the Anglophone world. So if anyone knows some examples, uh, let us know because that's really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, uh, conlanging using a logographic writing system... Uh, that yeah, that would be a huge undertaking. Um, it would be cool, but it would be a massive undertaking, and uh, I wouldn't know where to begin to do one. Uh, I don't think I have ever come across one. I don't. You think any so ideas, either. Edgar? No, I haven't come across anything, and I think it's for the reason that both you and Wingless Seraph state it's just so time consuming. Um, you know the difference in coming up with like twenty odd characters for an alphabet, and then like hundreds, if not thousands. Uh, for a logo graphic system, it's just yeah, it's just, it, I, I kind of question whether it's worth doing it uh, mm. for a conlang. Um, but then again, maybe if we do uncover some uh, Chinese-based conlangs, maybe it's so natural um, for people who live in China uh, that they would think that it's really silly to do an alphabet and really kind of uh, uh, I don't know restrictive or yeah, um, for them it might be really natural to go on the logo graphic route. Hmm. So the second one was, uh, how do you keep track of the level of technology in a setting? How do you eliminate inconsistencies in the inventions and developments available at a given time in a setting, especially in settings where magic is a natural and scientifically researchable phenomenon? Uh, Yeah, this is a real interesting one to me. Mm -hmm. I, hmm, I don't keep like very, very tight control of it but i do consider what things um exist and i consider what discoveries must be made in order for things to exist Mm -hmm. so yeah none of my i i never think of any of my worlds as having a direct analog to history because things wouldn't necessarily be discovered in the same order but there would have to be a chain of of discoveries before you could discover a certain technology like you can't have you can't have um cannons if you don't have reasonably advanced metallurgy for example Mm -hmm. and you can't have cannons if you don't have gunpowder which implies a knowledge of chemistry and and so on and so on so there's a chain there um but there's no reason that those things would happen have to happen in the same order as it did in our world Sure. Um, so I think just a kind of an awareness of technology and an, and an awareness of the science underpinning things is is the only answer there. If anyone does have resources for a kind of a, a real world technology tree, <laughs> like, you know, what you have in Civilization or, or Age of Empires or whatever, but based on reality, like what do you actually need before you can discover other things? That would be superb. <laughs> um So please do send those on to us or post them in in the Reddit or something. Um, And another important thing to consider, I think, is infrastructure. Like, you can... If you or I were to travel back to ancient Rome, all of the the scientific knowledge that we have would be useless because we wouldn't be able to actually 
get the materials to use any of it. Yeah. And it's all, it's all very well if you if you were to send someone back then and they know how to forge a, a, um, aluminium instead of instead of iron and steel. But if they don't have the materials to make a forge that can work aluminium, that's not relevant. And they wouldn't be able to get that because the infrastructure didn't exist and so on. Yeah. And the same with electricity. It doesn't matter that you know we would know how to make electricity. We wouldn't be able to utilize it effectively because the technological infrastructure isn't there. Um, so that's, that's just kind of another element to what I was saying about the, the chain of discoveries that's required. There's also the concern of what else exists relevant in in the world so you know one person could discover 50 years worth of earth scientific discoveries potentially but that wouldn't be like the entire world suddenly jumped 50 years in its technological advancement yeah i was i was going to add that uh inconsistent technological inconsistencies like cross uh cultures in your con world should be a thing that you strive for as opposed to trying to eliminate them. Um, mm. Kind of what you said there, like we, like on earth, uh, we have, we have companies that like are designing the robot overlords that are going to uh, uh, rule us one day. And at the same time, we also have cultures that are um, like, you know, that they're stone age, like undiscovered, uh, well, not maybe not Stone Age, but undiscovered like um, native peoples and things like that, or un un uncontacted native peoples, and so those type of inconsistencies and disparities are are, are natural, uh, mm-hmm. and they should be strived for. Like, there's no point having a con world where everyone has access to dilithium, and they all have superb dilithium technology. Like that's that's unrealistic, um, and then as long as those. Uh, disparities and this is what you said earlier are built upon reason and like uh sound progression then it'll make sense and everything will be fine like if there's a good reason why country a has all the dilithium technology and country b is stuck say 200 years uh, technologically in the past if there's a good sound logical reason for that then it'll all make sense and everything will be fine Mm -hmm. Uh, i think yeah yeah that that would make sense that i would agree with that don't make everything too homogenous and perfect because uh, worlds are messy. Yeah. Um, and their final question uh, is in regard to Bill's world building. Oh, that's me. <laughs> um, you, you got a mention on the show, Bill. <laughs> is there any intention to write a book or some other form in either of the settings? And if so, will the entire thing be written in a diegetic style? I mean, like an intention... In that, I think that would be cool, <laughs> but not in in terms of this is a, a plan I have actually sort of laid out, or I have a clear uh, means and intention of of achieving. Um, as regards the the diegetic style, definitely for Janspar, that's kind of core to what I want to do with that project. Is that it is it is entirely diegetic. Mm-hmm. Um, a little, I'm a little bit less strict with that for Handwavia. Um, sure. I, I still use it for Handwavia because that way I get to explore the idea um, in a slightly safer environment um, and kind of see what does and what doesn't work with regards to diegetism. Um, but I wouldn't be as tied to it, no. Yeah, but also, man, like, it's kind of become your thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's my it's my specialty. It's your specialty, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's if if you were to do it diegetically, uh, would you? I mean, the the two immediate ways of doing it that spring to mind would be you do a name of the wind sort of thing, where you have uh, a person literally narrating the story you want to tell, and you know, yeah, they they're the unreliable narrator, or you do a, a sort of. Uh, more esoteric thing where your where your book or your novel is like a collection of letters um yeah like so w- would you be drawn to any of those methods or is there a completely different method because you, um, you can't just simply write a story like if you're doing this diegetic stuff it's not as easy there has to be some well, sort of conceit i mean I, I think you could and you could do it the way that tolkien does it because 
the, Tolkien. No, it's it's not that prominent, but the the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are texts from within Middle Earth. They're they're extracts from the the the, the Red Book of whatever. Um, <laughs> the Red Book which of is, whatever. Which, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> Title. <laughs> I'm actually Googling that. <laughs> the Red Book of Westmarch, yes. Um is the is, is where the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are taken from. The, he like he presents them as extracts from this from this volume. Um so you could do it that way. You could you could write a novel and present that this is a novel. So say I was writing it in Yanspar, I could say that this is an, a novel. Uh, written by an author from Hearth. Oh, sure, like Handmaid's Tale as well is the same sort of sh- shtick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's yeah, totally. Uh, so yeah, I, I I didn't even consider that. Write a normal story, and at the end or beginning, just say that this comes from the world. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I have a question, man. Speaking of mm-hmm. di- diegeses, is that would that be right? Yes. Yay. Yeah, diegeses, uh, I think so. Do you th- Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire? Is that diegetic? Given that it's told from each character's perspective, and it's there's a whole lot of flawed narrator, and it doesn't at least I know it's been years since I read the book. At least there doesn't seem to be a whole lot like I, the author, now I'm going to tell you backstory of this world. It all comes from the characters, and we get it from many, many differing and contrary points of view. I wouldn't say it's it's exactly diegetic. No, it's it's what's that called? It's the um. Third person limited. Third so person it's limited. Third third person limited perspective. I think it's called. Oh. Um. Yeah. So the the narrator only has access to the thoughts and feelings of the character. Oh. Um, they they only see it from that point of view, but it's it's not it's not from their point of view as such, and it's it's also not omnipresent. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. That so, makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you could you could maybe make the argument, but I, I I wouldn't say it's the intention that's there as such. Sure. Okay. So it's it kind of it depending on how you look at it, you it, you might say it blurs the line, but it's not. yeah. I, I would say it's, it, you could say it's a, a middle ground. Sure. Okay. But it's not like uh, George Martin sat down and was like, "I am writing a diegetic work. This is it." Yeah, I don't think so. Cool. Um, really quickly, without getting into a massive thing, because we are in follow-up, uh, have you been watching... Spoilers, 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 spoilers. Have you been watching uh, Game of Thrones? Uh, and No spoilers, because I have not been watching it. You've not been watching it. Okay, can you... I don't know... Could you answer this question? Sure, you'll, you'll definitely be able to answer this question, because you read the most of the books. Uh, uh, how, do you have any guesses as to how it might end? No. Okay. Do you know what... Do you know what I'm finding? Like, I don't really know or care. I'll just wait for it to happen and then we'll, that I think it's more interesting to talk about after the fact. But loads of people are coming to me and, like, unanimously, everyone's, like, clearly uh, the, the White Walker dude, the king, the Night King. He's just going to sit on the Iron Throne and everyone's going to be dead. And I was like, I get how you're coming to that conclusion because Game of Thrones loves killing everyone. But, like, I think that would be such a like a disappointing ending just to be all like everyone's dead uh that i don't think they're going to do that like i think they're going too nihilistic yeah yeah and it's also not very i don't know it's not very engaging it's almost so monumentally brutal that it's almost like you don't really feel anything do you know what i mean yeah, it's, it's not very narratively satisfying. Yeah, exactly. But everyone seems to be on board with it. Like, numerous times, different people have been all like, yeah, your man sits on the throne. Uh, like, Danny and John are, like, the zombies at his feet. And I was like, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Uh, but then I don't have anything to offer in retort. I'm just like, I don't really care. I'll see, wait to see what happens. Um, yeah, I'm a full season behind at this stage. The last thing I saw was the Battle of the Bastards. So oh, wow. I need to finish. I need to finish, finish season six and watch season seven and then catch up on this season. All right. So that's that's one bit of follow up done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what's our next bit? I'll, I'll take this next bit as follow up. Um, sure. So we had uh, an email from an anonymous person. Uh 
who wrote in to talk to us about Patreon. So this is going to be a little bit esoteric here, but I think it's really important uh, to kind of um, add my voice to the conversation around this. Uh, Patreon has been under fire of late Mm -hmm. from everyone. And there's, uh, I see an awful lot of... uh, like Patreon hipsters who are all kind of like, I'm too cool for Patreon. Patreon's the man. Uh, I don't support Patreon. I don't use Patreon, all sort of jazz. And um, this is kind of stemmed from Patreon doing things like the merchandising thing where now they have this pro level thing where they take a bigger cut. And more worryingly, uh, most worryingly of all, is that Patreon is VC funded. So there's a whole heap of rich people that dumped money into the thing. And without that money, it would not be able to run. Like, it's not profitable. It's not self-sustainable. Um, at least in the eyes of the venture capitalists that back it, which means that invariably Patreon is going to start upping fees for everyone mm-hmm. involved in order to keep the venture capitalists happy, uh, which is problematic. Uh, and something that uh, people are really quick to point out to creators and be all like, look, you're on a terrible platform. Uh, just a heads up, I want to put this out there. We all, we us creators, we got it. We're keeping an eye on the situation. And if ever Patreon does something incredibly terrible, um, we will attempt to uh, jump ship and find a different solution. But right now, coming from the world of YouTube and its terrible, terrible uh, revenue split with the creators, uh, Patreon is like this golden, wondrous uh, land <laughs> where they just shower you with bounty. And they leave you the hell alone and you just do your thing, get paid for doing your thing. And it's wonderful. Uh, and it's a super easy site to use. So compared to, uh, compared to YouTube, it's, 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 it's great uh, and hasn't yet turned uh, as bad as people think it's already turned. So that's uh, point one. The other point, which the anonymous uh, writer points out, is that um, there's stuff in Patreon's, con- um, not terms of service, like contract, I suppose. Um, the small print that you have to go through if you want to sign up for the service um, that basically says that you do not own your content anymore uh, when on Patreon. So like they have the usual like lawyery thing, unlimited uh, worldwide uh, free use of your content. Um, And again, lots of people are using that as as a um, means of, as an excuse to not, go on Patreon and to not support people and to kind of disavow the company. Uh, And again, just to kind of push back against that because this is how I make my living. Um, And it's important to me to kind of like present the other side of this. Uh, This sort of clause in contracts is, sounds really terribly scary, uh, but it's kind of common across social media platforms. Uh, Facebook do the same thing as well. Um, And I think what it's there for is that they can market like, so they can, you know, they could use your videos or whatever to market their platform, uh, which I'm fine with. I think that's totally cool. Um, And Facebook being like the world's worst company company, and usually has no problem screwing over its users. I don't think there's been any cases where it's used that clause in its contract where it literally just like takes all your content. Do you know what I mean? Like, and takes it away from you and you can't ever use it again. Uh, so that, that particular clause that people are getting very scared about at the moment is it's largely just a marketing thing. And at the end of the day as well, you own the masters to all your content. Like all of my content lives on my hard drive and I own that. And I can put that up on a self-service, uh, like a, my own website if I choose to. Um, so it's not like they own everything. Does that make sense? So all that is to say, uh, I've heard, like from the anonymous person here, lots of concern about Patreon. And lots of people saying that they've gone full evil and they don't want anything to do with Patreon. Uh, I'm not on board with that stance. Uh, They haven't gone full evil evil yet. Companies are wanting to do this and we're all keeping an eye out. Uh, But trust me from the inside, uh, having, you know, been on Facebook, YouTube and Patreon and the whole shebang. Patreon is by far the kindest uh, solution there is for creators right now. Uh, And if it changes... Uh, will reassess but right now it's not panic stations that makes sense yes yeah um just to put it out there because again there's a whole lot of negativity and negativity that is adversely affecting creators um and that i i don't i want to see creators flourish and not be adversely affected by kind of uh scaremongering 
Um, but yeah, so uh, so that's point two. Sorry, very serious non world building, but I thought that it was it was important. Do you want to finish up on the last point of follow up? Why not? So we got uh, another email from Randall Carlson, proponent of the Younger Dryas extinction uh, hypothesis, I believe. Notable, notable uh, fringe academic friend of Graham Hancock. <laughs> what? All right, so Randall, do you know of any, do you know any of these names that I just shouted at you? Uh, Graham Hancock's an economist, isn't he? No, Gra- Graham Hancock is how how does one describe Graham Hancock? Graham Hancock is uh, a lunatic. Is is, oh, okay. I, is how it's described. He has very very fringe views. Uh, with regards to, um, like, he, he thinks basically that there was a an intelligent, uh, a super advanced civilization that existed d- d- however long ago, and it was wiped out by a, uh, like, an extinction level event sort of thing. So he's he's into all of this crazy oh. su- su- pseudoscientific nonsense. And I believe this guy, Randall Carlson, who we got the email from, is a similar thing. The Younger Dryas I- extinction is this notion that around 12,000 years ago, there there may have been, or there definitely was, I, I can't remember which one, a big event. And people like Hancock and Carlson use it to kind of say, well, before that, there was, you know, crazy advanced, technologically advanced civilizations, which is you know, a heap of nonsense. But anyhow, Randall Carlson wrote into the show, we've made it, Bill. <laughs> um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So what does Mr. Carlson want to say? <laughs> um, first off, I love the YouTube channel. Um, watch it before any of their other subscriptions, apart from a Transformer fan channel. Um, Transformer fans are really hardcore fans. I've noticed that recently. It's pretty cool. Are they? Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen a lot of like Transformer stuff on Twitter recently and like, People who are into Transformers are really into Transformers. Is, is there like new Transformer movies or something? Is there anything that's in the zeitgeist that is elevating Transformers at the moment? Uh, well, there's always new comics and stuff. There's a cartoon coming out soon or came out recently, mm. but it's, it's like a kid's cartoon. Um, like, I guess, a younger kid's cartoon. Um, and there was Bumblebee recently, which is like a, a reboot, a film reboot of Transformers. It's not connected to the Michael Bay films. <coughs> oh, God. Reboots. Oh, God. Uh, excuse me. Oh, God. Michael Bay Transformers. Well, both of those things are very bad. Um, I just, I don't like, reboots. Reboots. I don't like Michael Bay. I didn't like Michael Bay's Transformers. I, I hate, I hate with such an unending passion the constant, the, the notion of reboots. Oh, Anyhow, yeah, sorry. Nah, wipe the slate clean, start over. Well, yeah, but I would say wipe the slate clean, start over, and maybe uh, use an entirely different set of characters, a different time frame. I, I hate the notion of, like, we're starting this anew, and by anew, we mean it's exactly like the old thing with a few changes. Like, I hate, like like with Star Wars, I hate that. We were, I was watching Once Upon a Time, uh, which is a TV show about, like, it's a fairy tale TV show with the captain. And they did the same thing. I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, and so they did the same thing. They got to, like, season six or seven or whatever, and they literally, they literally just rebooted the story as is, but changed the location. And it's like, wh- why are we so creatively deprived that we can't just come up with a different story? Like, and the same, again, same thing with Star, uh, with Star Wars. Why did we have to soft reboot the franchise could we not have told the story about like you know in the star wars universe set like thousands of years before what we've known like the the dawning of the first jedi or something completely unrelated but no we have to do this continuous cycle of rebooting and soft rebooting because this no because marketing people have determined that when people are familiar with a thing they're more likely to buy tickets to the thing and it's just it's just the, the creative person to me just dies every time I hear the word reboot. Oh, and I can imagine, sorry, I realize I'm ranting here, but can you imagine if they were just like, oh, Game of Thrones came to the end. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to reboot it. And you're like, no, don't do that. Like, tell us a different story. Leave it alone. You know, like Breaking Bad is a great example of a thing that was just left alone and is perfect. No reboots, no restarts, nothing needed. Just leave the thing alone. 
<sighs> Sorry, I'm done. I mean, apart from the prequel they made. But... They didn't... What? They made a prequel? Yeah, Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul is, uh, is a different enough that I don't class it as like a reboot or a... Like, okay, Saul's, yeah, Saul's in but it. Yeah, what I'm saying is they, they didn't just leave it alone. They, they've continued the universe by telling a new story. Sure. Yeah, and that and again, that is entirely fine, but it would not have been fine if, with me if we got, like, a Walter White story before Breaking Bad. Do you know what I mean? Like, take the characters, the central characters um, that the show is built around and just just keep wringing them out until we've sucked all the life of them just to make more money, you know? So Better Call Saul is fine in my books. Um, they they avoided doing the stupid thing, I think, there. Uh, anyhow, sorry, I'm ranting, I'm ranting. Uh, where were we? Transformers. Uh, this Randall Carlson, uh, notable fringe academic, uh, likes the show, but not as much as Transformers. Cool, right, let's move on. Let's go to the next point. <laughs> I, I have thoughts on that topic. We'll, we'll put a pin on that until another episode. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll stick... Uh, let me, let me put it in the... Uh, let me put it on top of the show notes for next episode. Uh, reboots. Bill has thoughts. So, um, the the thrust of the email is, do you do commission work concerning Conlangs? Um, and they tell us about the, the project that, that they are working on. Um, we, but the, the main thing is, do we do commission work? Uh, yeah, we, we won't mention the project because I'm not entirely sure if we, if we can or not. Uh, answer to that is, I don't anyways. I don't think Bill does either. I'm assuming you don't. I, I haven't done enough conlanging to be comfortable Bingo. doing it commercially. And I don't think, I, I think I'm actually quite a terrible conlanger. Like, I really enjoy studying linguistics and kind of presenting linguistic stuff and, and hoping that conlangers will um, get inspiration from it. I really don't think I'm a very good conlanger, so I, 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 don't, I won't do commissions at all. But we decided to, to bring up this email uh, to put it out into uh, the artifacts sphere. Maybe someone out there uh, is has you know has created many 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 you know dozens of conlangs and is perfect comfortable with this and loves it and they might be able to help you out. So uh, if anyone is interested uh, in helping fringe academic Randall Carlson, friend of Gray and Hancock, uh, <laughs> writing a conlang, uh, put put it in the show notes uh, or put it in in the subreddit or send us an email and uh, we'll pass it on if if that's what uh, uh, Professor Carlson uh, wants. Yeah. <laughs> I love the notion. I think because I, I read the email, I was like, "Why do I know that name?" And it's like, "Oh yeah, Randall Carson." I just I love the notion that a person like Randall Carson listens to artifacts. I think that's just class. <laughs> and we don't. I bet you're going to be really embarrassed. If it is the same Randall Carlson and you've just slated him and we have lost a listener. Oh, that's entirely fine. If it actually is Randall Carson, I'm fine with Randall Carson not listening because he's he's clearly a crank. Like I've listened to him talk. It's it's not it's not great now. Uh, and I've listened to your man Hancock and I'm just kind of like, oh, oh, good God. Um, Hancock actually really, really quickly. He was on Joe Rogan recently and he. He legitimately, like, I'm not, I'm... I what? Swear. And he's not, like, a respected thinker? <laughs> well, no, man, man, I, I realise Joe, Joe Rogan has on a whole load of fringe people, but he also has on people who are legit. Like, you know, like, like I know Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example, like, he's not a crank. I realise he's not a hardcore academic. He's, a like, a personality more than anything else. But, like, he's not a crank, and he comes on the show, and, like, he has you know, sports people who are genuine, you know, leaders in their fields on, like, um, yeah, I don't think just because you're on Joe Rogan means that you're automatically kind of a looper, um, if that no, makes sense. I, I would not say that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but yeah, he was on, he was on Joe Rogan and like, I'm not paraphrasing him here and I, you can go find the bit in, in the latest one that he was on. Uh, he legitimately was all like, we cannot outrule uh, telepathy uh, when it comes to investigating how the ancient Egyptians were able to build the pyramids. He was like, they shouldn't have been able to do this. We don't know why they were able to do this. And we can't not say it's like uh, t- telepathic extra sort of cognitive abilities. And I was like, holy sh**. He, he just advocated for ancient Egyptian magic uh, being a thing. And I'm like, oh. It was, it was, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, yeah, children wouldn't even 
say these silly things. And here is a guy who is like supposedly a respected, uh, like um, investigative journalist. And it's just like, oh, the lot of them with their, the whole crew, like Carlson and, and Hancock, they're just, they're just, they're just awful, 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 awful. Uh, but I'm sure uh, our Randall Carlson is a great person. I mean, it is cool, though. Like, from a world-building point of view, it's cool. And this is one of the reasons why I continue to kind of listen to these type of people, is because, like, like they're essentially really great storytellers. Like, they, they, they have, have come up with a really interesting story about the world, which is utterly untrue, but really interesting. Um, and so I listen to them. But I, at the same time, I can be all like, You're, this is not science. And what you're saying is not accurate and it's not reflective of the world. Um, And I think that's important to do when listening to them. Like, uh, it's important not to get sucked down the rabbit hole and be all like, yeah, yeah, Mr. Carlson, Mr. Hancock, you are dead right. Because they are not. They are dead wrong. (laughs) Anywho, I want to apologize to everyone for the rants. I don't know if the rants will stay in the show, but there's at least two or three in there that I did in this very short uh, uh, follow-up section. Uh, uh, sorry to everyone. Let's all... Let's very all... short 40-minute follow-up section. <laughs> By our standards. So let's all let's all head into head into writer's room and we're all going to chill and listen to Bill uh, read us. L- listen to Bill give us a bit of escapism and he takes us off into the world of romance. That sound okay? I think it sounds sounds lovely. (laughs) Uh, So, as Edgar said, we are returning to romance again. And um, once more, this is a uh, a document rather than last week when I, I, uh, last episode, when I uh, provided a map. Again, this is me reading out a document from within the world of romance in the Handwavia setting. Cool. Two, Office of Special Trade. I am forwarding these accounts under the general order pertaining to your office. A number of singular events have occurred in this region in recent days, likely of common and potentially hostile origin. I shall proceed directly with a reproduction of the relevant reports altered only to clarify relevant information regarding locations and other local details. Ship's Log, Corvette Vassa. Training patrol flight over the mountains to the southeast of Depot 15, Vicol Province South. Mid-morning, human figure spotted traversing a mountain pass, a route known to our navigators but considered unused. Figure was heading northwest, no settlements for many days travel in their direction of origin. Dangerous creatures known to inhabit this area. Entry log. Uplay village. Adjacent to Depot 15. Description. Male. Short. Broad build. Dark skinned. Clothing of unknown origin. Stated origin. Anches. Stated business. Nomadic trader. Name. Tal Eli. Effects. Assorted bags containing objects of minor value. No contraband discovered. Entry and processing fee paid. Supplementary notes. Entrant arrived on foot from a southerly direction, travelling alone. Disciplinary log. Runner Lutiel. Junior Gunner Arbe. Charged with drunkenness. Failure to present. Sentenced hard duty 12 days. Rated hand Sian. Charged drunkenness, gambling. Sentenced hard duty, 20 days. Half pay, 20 days. Rated hand, Yolin. Charged brawling. Sentenced confinement and corporal beating. Unrated hand, Petty. Charged drunkenness, insubordination. Sentenced hard duty, 30 days. Lieutenant, third class, Enthia. Charged drunkenness, Failure to present, loss of company property. Enthia did not present for duty at this noon's assembly of crew, was found in a distressed state in Uple village, speaking incoherently and not responding to orders or threats of disciplinary action, was found to no longer be in possession of company-issued items of rank. Witnesses report her speaking to and drinking in the presence of a trader recently arrived in Uple, described as a short man of unknown origin. 
sentenced disrated until a proper disciplinary hearing for her commission may be convened. Probationary officer second class Dieten, charged insubordination, sentenced grounding and administrative duty 10 days, recommend return to academy for probationary evaluation. Report. Weird Bolshe of Corvette Vassa. Having spent the evening engaged in calculation and preparation for the vessel's upcoming long-distance patrol, and being scheduled to remain as the overnight duty officer aboard the ship while in depot, I took a short walk around the shipyard to refresh my body and mind before assuming this duty. Upon this walk, I happened to pass a number of ships recently seized, undergoing maintenance and processing. I observed that a member of the guard tasked with securing this region of the yard was lying on the ground at his post. Upon closer examination he was dead, with a wound in his side, though no damage had been done to his clothing. I summoned the remaining guards in the area and additional personnel, and we undertook a search of the vessels. No assailant was discovered. However, aboard one of the seized vessels, lately known as the Sanan, a previously undiscovered compartment was found in the hold, cunningly hidden in the structure of the vessel. Though this compartment was empty, my findings indicate it recently held an item of significance and value. These are the documents relevant to the matter at hand. My own belief, supported by the analyses of Weird Bolshe, the other Weirds stationed in Depot 15, and my own staff, is that this nomadic trader, Pal Eli, is responsible for the theft of this unknown item from within the Senan, using objects stolen from Lieutenant Enlia to aid in his subterfuge and to gain access to the shipyard. A thorough search of the depot, of Uple village, and of the surrounding land has been fruitless in discovering any trace of this individual. In addition to posting a general notice for Talilai to all company posts, the crew of the Aspire, who took the Sanan originally, have been summoned for interviews. I trust your office to take appropriate note of these events and to allow me access to any resources relevant to the situation. Kavan Tegrevai, Ground Captain Tamar Company, Vikal Province, South Depot. Cool. Very cool. All right. I have questions. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay. Um, so first of all, just general general overview. I'm assuming the last part, the last paragraph, is just like a uh, a summation of what came before. Yeah, straight up summation. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So then I don't need to. I don't need to get in the background. Uh, the bits that popped out to me then. Um, revert in reverse chronological order. Uh, v call province, right? Mm-hmm. Was that on the map? It was. It was. Do you remember where? Just give me a, a compass location as to where it was. Fairly central. Fairly central. Okay, cool. Um, so it's to the south. It's kind of to the immediate south of the the spires kind of region. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Um, map in the show notes for anyone who wants to see. Um, not related to the story, but a question on naming. Uh, the person mm-hmm. who wrote this letter, Kavon Te Grivai, mm-hmm. uh, he's the second person that has Te in his name. We had Yar Te Yarlin and Kavon. Uh, he might be, I think he's the third. Oh, is he the third? Yeah. Who's the other Te? Um, I forget the surname, but Tejag, who wrote the Year's Rise Revel. Oh, it's like Tejag Te Shincha or something. Uh, Dajag Te Shincha. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it's the third one. Uh, question then on the Te in the in between the first, the, what I assume is the first and second name. Is that like a son of, like Mac or O in Irish? Um, it, it is a it is an indication that it's a family name. Yes. Sound okay. Cool. Very cool. All right. It is it is not son of, but it's yeah, kind of family of. Fa- yeah, yeah, belonging to the Gravai clan or whatever that sort of thing. Yeah. Um. Cool. Very cool. Um. What are you mentioned? Weird bullshit. What? And then you mentioned the other weirds. What's a weird? And it's capitalized. So it's a proper noun. What? What is this? We had this before. What? Oh, I'm sorry. We had this before. What's so? What's a weird then? I'm sorry. I can't remember. 
It's uh, it's a ship's officer. It's like it's it's one of the officers aboard uh, aboard a vessel. We did, we did. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, the Sanan. I lo- uh, this bit I do remember. The Sanan had the uh, va- uh, the item of value. Uh, yeah. In it, and now we know that it's it may be with this uh, Tal Eli person, which I think is cool. Um, yeah. Really enjoy that. Uh, be interested to see what that is. There's no clue in this text as to whether it's what that is, but I hope we find out one day. Um, what is a Corvette? Like not the uh, car. It's, it's a it's a small vessel. It's um uh it's like the 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 size of ship kind of under a frigate. So it's a, it's a kind of a small fast armed vessel. Okay, cool. Do you know if the car mm. is named after this? Presumably, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that was a naval term. Cool. Um, what is a rated and unrated hand? So they're just um, kind of non-officer ranks. So it, it would be like being an able seaman or a, a landsman in a historical sailing vessel. So a rated hand is someone with experience of working aboard a vessel. An unrated hand is someone without experience of working aboard a vessel. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. Uh, did you make this up, or is this the actual? Are these actual proper nomenclatures? Um, no, it's it's like based on being an able seaman versus being right. a landsman. Okay, but I, I I made up that specific terminology. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to assume. I should. Sorry, I should. I should instead of just asking you these questions, I should have read out the bits that are relevant. Apologies, listeners. Uh, about so about midway through the text, you write here disciplinary log runner Lotiel. Lotiel, yeah. Lotiel. Uh, runner, I'm assuming then, to capitalize again, proper noun, I'm assuming that's, like Corvette, that's a designation of ship. Yes, exactly. Okay, so where, so you said a Corvette, Corvette is like a small armored or small military type, fast military type thing. What's a runner in yeah. relation to that? A runner is more like a courier ship. It's more like a defined courier ship. So like it's it's fast and not heavily armed, but it's it's for getting messages quickly between places. All right, so would would non so like it carries the mail, right? Oh, so so non military organizations would perhaps use runner ships, potentially as well. But this one is belonging to the Tamar Company. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and oh, I marked down Tal Eli, um, mm-hmm. just because I thought I today for for reasons you know like YouTube rabbit hole, I got listening to Israeli music artists. Um, mm-hmm. And just Tali Lai sounds really Hebrew. I just thought, I note that, I just thought it sounds really cool. It's a very nice name. Cool. Uh, and then what else have we got here? I got the Corvette thing again. Uh, a Depot 15. I'm assuming there's not a whole lot with Depot 15 other than it's a depot off this village in the province of uh, Vilco, v- Vicol. Vicol, yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing of note there, is there? Um, it's never mentioned before or anything. No, just the depot is is a name for a Tamar Company base, okay. like um, the the one that Yarthen uh, navigated back to was the Usin Province Depot, sure. and this is the Vikal Province South Depot, like Starbase Sixteen. Sure. Is it Sixteen? What's the? I don't know. There's one. There's one famous starbase that gets uh, wheeled out and off. I can't remember which one. Um, and then the very last thing at the very start, you say uh, in forwarding these accounts under the capital general order uh, pertaining to mm-hmm. your office. General order, like a standing order, like there is a a ongoing order to all officers within the Tamar Company that certain matters must be brought to the attention of the Office of Special Trade. Oh, like like an APB sort of thing. Uh, not exactly. More like, more like you know, if if you discover something, you have to talk about it. You have to pass it on, pass on the information. Okay, sure, cool. Um, all right, and uh, sorry, one last thing. Uple village. Yeah. Is is it common for there to be like a military? It seems strange that there's like a military depot beside a village. Is that normal? Why? I don't know. It just seems like I grew up in a small village. It just seems odd to me the notion that outside of my village there would be like a big ass military depot with like ships in it and military crew. It, it strikes me as a thing that like would be in a city. 
or near a city, like near civilization, as opposed to like near a tiny little village. Or maybe I'm just totally wrong. It just strikes me as weird. But like, you're going to need to have military locations outside of cities. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, maybe it's the notion that it's a depot that's hurting my brain here. As in, like, it's a place where we store all these things. Like, it's like, I get the notion of, like, a central hub uh, in my head. Mm. And then having a central hub next to a village sounds weird to me. It's like, th- this is a, this is an outpost for the Tamar Company. I see, when you frame it like outpost, suddenly I'm like, oh, that makes sense. But a depot strikes me as a bigger, more centralized thing. Um, that's that's just the name that the Tamar Company use for their... Sure. For their outpost. Sure. And again, I'm just I'm just like being all like, this is what I uh, think about the thing. Yeah. Uh, I well, have a mm, criticism it, of the work. Um, let me just clarify about oh. the depot thing first. Like, there, there would be smaller ones further out, but this is kind of like a... It, it'd be like maintaining a port in a foreign nation, kind of. Or like maintaining a... You know, like in the days of colonization, that you would be able to resupply in... Uh, South Africa before sailing to Australia if you were coming from Europe. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. So it's an outlying location, but it's still like it's it's reasonably well stocked and stuff. Cool, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Criticism of the and work. the village is oh. like it's not it wasn't put there because of the village. This kind of happens to be a village there, and the village has kind of done okay economically because of the presence of the base. Right. Okay. Okay. So the base is kind of feeding the village. That makes sense. Yeah, they're they're how, kind of feeding each other. How big is the village population wise? Um, well, a couple of hundred, probably. A couple of hundred. So, like, exactly like my hometown. Um, isn't sure. It, isn't it weird? I sometimes think about that. And, like, I'm like, I come from a town. And, like, at the time when I was growing up, it had, like, 700 people in it. Like, that's weird. That's, that is weird is to me. Now that I spend all my time in cities. Like, I live next to a million people. Uh, and that seems normal. And the notion of when I go back home, and it's like, there are but 700 people here. is just strange. <laughs> If you say. <laughs> Just an observation. Anyway, criticism criticism of the work. Um, Go for it. And usually I'm all like, it's great. And it is great. Uh, I think the last, you shouldn't have put in the last paragraph, man. No? No. This, the last, for, for, for people listening, the last paragraph was the bit where Bill, um, where the person, where Cavon, um, who is writing this uh, this letter or just like bulletin or whatever, uh, he basically summarizes the state of affairs that is kind of outlined in the body of the letter. And I get why you're doing that because it makes sense in letter form, but it would have been so much better if that wasn't included and we just had to piece together how these incidents linked up, do you know what I mean? And not have the writer basically tell us. Maybe then for the purpose of the the teaser that I post um, before this this episode goes out, I'll take out that last paragraph. Yeah, man. If 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 you're okay with doing a little extra work, that's class. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's hit the backspace button. It's fine. Sure, yeah. Um, um, ah, but like uploading and like sorting out and uploading different. But yeah, that, that's cool. That's really cool. Because then, then you can really be all like, because you kind of have to, it's not straightforward, the different uh, things that are reporting the body of the work. And you kind of have to be all like, wait, that second one, that's, that's related to that first one. And I'm pretty sure that that stocky guy is the guy mentioned here. And then you can begin to piece it together. And it's just kind of ruined when it's like, oh yeah, dear reader, here is how everything gets pieced together. Okay. Yeah. We'll put up a, a condensed version as a, as a teaser. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, and those are my questions. Have you got anything uh, to add? Again, the usual, anything that I missed, uh, some salient points, etc. Um. Yes. Yes. Oh, I missed a, I missed a, okay, right. What did I miss? <laughs> um, we've met Tally Lie before. No. Yeah. When the hell did we meet Tally Lie before? When indeed. I'm going to leave that up to the listeners. Oh, damn it. Hold on. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I, I'm going to try and Google Tally Lie in quotes here. This might work. That won't get you anywhere. It won't? Because I named him this morning. Okay, so he was unnamed in a previous work, right? Mm-hmm. Ah, well then, I can't really, I'm not going to be able to get this. I'm going to have to read all your stuff again. This is a cunning ploy, Bill, to up the hits on your on your Tumblr, isn't it? Ha 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 ha. No, I'll have a read through uh, and see, can I establish something for the next show? So we know of him 
Okay. Is there anything in the in the in this um, letter, this month's letter, that would be a hint as to who he might be in the previous work? Yeah, the descriptions. I mean, clear. he was a nomadic trader. We met nomadic traders before. Did we meet nomadic traders in 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 Yanspar or in this? I can't remember. Hmm. Okay, but we met Taddy Light. Anything else? The the officer of special trade is kind of a, a euphemistically uh, named uh, division within the Tamar Company, um, dealing with kind of it's it's not actually all that interested with trade in, in so much as it is with subterfuge and uh, kind of slightly dirty war. But I guess that was that was probably reasonably clear. <laughs> so, um, so this is this is uh, a romance version of like area uh, or section thirty one. Uh yeah, kind it's, of. It's like military sanctioned, but a bit under the under the table sort of thing. Uh, I'm not super familiar with with Section Thirty One, but broadly that kind of thing. Yeah, cool, very cool. It's a very unassuming and... name for something that's potentially a bit covert. That's cool. Oh, do you reckon? Well, yeah, but that's a good thing though. You don't want your covert okay. division to be called the big covert division. Do you know what I mean? But but then no one would take it seriously. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> do, like, did you ever watch Kim Possible? Kim, man, Kim Pop. I adored Kim Possible as a youngster. I love that program so. Did you ever see the episode where they went to Area Fifty One? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> well, there's an there's an episode where they they like have to fight a bad guy in Area Fifty One, and it turns out that the secret behind Area Fifty One is that all of it's true. All of the conspiracy theories are accurate, and they like the military put them out so that no one would believe them. That's a good ploy. That's a very good ploy. ploy. Um, and Ron gets very like, confused by this and says, but then there is no secret. And the general's like, exactly. Um, <laughs> that was a great so, show. Yeah. I love that show. Uh, it was. It was a really good show. Oh, the mole rat. Oh, yeah. Everything um, what else? Uh, I mean, it's pretty suspicious for a trader to turn up just like carrying what he has on his person without like a cart or anything or without traveling in a group. Um, which was part of what made it like clear that mm. there was something suspicious going on with him. Sure. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's cool. pretty much everything. Cool. I like it. I like it. I I think I I, I particularly enjoy the variety. Like one one month a map, and the next month like not even a piece of prose because it's not really a story. It's like it's like a bulletin. I really enjoy that variety. And sure, next mm-hmm. month, if we go back to regular pros, that's like that's great as well. So, the, so props, really enjoy. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload just the the documents. I'm not going to put the the opening or the ending paragraph. I'm just going to upload the four the four documents. Bingo. And then maybe maybe re-upload them with the the beginning and ending bits after the the episode goes out or something like that. Yeah, or we'll or we'll link both in the show notes, say or whatever. We'll we'll find a way. It'll be great. Yeah. Um. Cool. Uh, shall we crack on to, to my stuff? Uh, yeah, let's. All right. Uh, so real, real quickly, I actually don't have a whole lot to say uh, uh, this month. Um, I just released a video called Tense Aspect and Mood in OA, or at least I think that's what it's called. It went through like three or four name changes, and I kind of don't remember what I settled on in the end. <laughs> uh, but have you? So have you seen the video? I have seen the video. Uh, as always, have you got any things to point out? Uh, before I address two, one point that I think was pretty salient that came up in in the uh, in the comments, um, there was one thing that I didn't fully follow. I'm actually going to look at the video real quick. Do it, man! I love them uh, views. Don't close <laughs> the ad. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, what was it like working with Bibliridian? Bibliridian uh, was brilliant. Uh, now, I don't want to, you know, massage Bibliorium's ego too much here, uh, nor do I want this to come across as sounding hyperbolic, but, like, the dude is genuinely so clever, right? And so erudite. And like, when, we did, when we did the initial Skype call and we're mulling things over, he was just like, oh, yeah, that's kind of a bit like Turkish, and out he comes with a little bit of Turkish. Or, like, oh, that's very much like Greek. And then it's like, he has this, like, it, like can grasp this instantaneously. Whereas, like, I, I encounter many languages 
all the time reading uh, my stack of linguistic books here, but I retain none of it. But he seems to be able to like soak it up like a linguistic sponge and just have it on him at all times. And I, that from the first Skype call, I was like, my God, this guy, he's, this guy is the real deal. It's really great. And he's, he's lovely and chill and just like any edits or stuff. It was all super calm. It just went back and forth real easy. It was fantastic. So I need, I need everyone, everyone to go over and, and go to his YouTube and subscribe to him because he's, he's a much better conlanger than I ever would be. He's fantastic. That's great. That's great. Uh, and he's, um, he's, he lives in, I don't know, well, he, he lives in, or should I say this? I'll say it and then you can deem whether or not this is... Nah, I don't. Say. What? Nah, I don't. Oh, well, I was going to say he's a, he's a fellow Celt and I kind of feel a bit of like uh, familial oh, yeah. bonds to that. Celtic solidarity. Celtic solidarity, exactly. Um, but we'll cut that bit because there's no clean thing anyways. Anyway, so you're... Uh, Sorry, so we'll, what, we'll, we'll take it again if you want. We'll, we'll take it again if you want because I do want to say Celtic solidarity on air. You really want to say Celtic solidarity? I would like to say that on air, yes. Uh, can you use the word word Celtosphere? I will try. Oh, well, no, as in can one. Sure, why not? Sure, okay. Uh, and another cool thing about uh, Bibiridian is that he currently resides... Uh, in the broader Celtosphere. And there's a bit of, you know, you know, like family about that. And that I really like that as well. Celtic solidarity. Celtic solidarity. <laughs> I'm all about Celtic solidarity. <laughs> all about that Celtic solidarity. Um, so yeah, everyone, please, please, please go check out stuff. It's great. You'll love it. Uh, one of my favorite videos of his actually is about how to go about um, <clears throat> doing triconsonantal roots. Um, so, you know, a certain... Like uh, in Semitic languages. Bingo, exactly. How to conlang uh, Semitic languages, essentially. And it cool. is great. Like, no frills or nothing. It's just, like, straight to the point. Here's how you do it. And it's wonderful. Um, go Seriously, go check it out. I'll put a ton of links in the show notes. But anyhow. Great. What was the thing that you so, said you uh, you did not uh, uh, quite grasp? Right. So, so the thing I wasn't sure about was... Um, uh, Bill Meridian says that the state of verbs are not compatible with past habituals. Mm-hmm. So things like I to need, to want, and to have permission um, are not compatible with past habituals. So having been in the past. But can you not say, is it not coherent to say I needed to have been? Yeah, sure, exactly. Um, th- so is, is that a general linguistic thing or is there something specific about the way uh, OA is constructed that makes them incompatible or what? No, no, it's an OA thing because um, uh, Bibberini says uh, something like because of um, the lexical source of them, they don't, this doesn't work in OA. Um, but, li- but like okay. you said, you can just uh, do it periphrastically. Like you can just do a whole bunch of words to make that makes sense. So you can't say, I used to have, uh, I used to have to go say, but mm-hmm. you could say something like, I, uh, permission, uh, past go, that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like you can use other words, non-grammatical words to indicate that it's just that it cannot be grammaticalized in OA. Okay. So yeah, I, I interpreted what he was saying as a general thing that, statives are not compatible with with past habituals no no so that's that's uh, or at least uh, that, uh, the only thing i can say is that it definitely is we're talking about oh i don't we never mentioned whether or not that is a broader linguistic thing i don't know but it's certainly okay in oa uh this sort of ungrammatical thing comes out of uh the way we've we've set it up or the way bibberini has set it up gotcha um, that as always bill it's mad right like you always get to the sort of the crux of a problem. Like, you just straight to the point and you, you pick out the salient points straight away. That was the big thing I wanted to address. Like, loads of people were like, I don't understand that bit. How can, you know, I have, to, I used to have to go is a perfectly valid thing to want to say. Are you, mm. are you telling me that in OA you cannot say this? And I wanted to talk about the difference between, like, using grammaticalized things and using just extra words to convey meaning. And that's, that's, so you hit the nail on the head there, man. Excellent. I, my, 
miscomprehension matched other people's. Exactly. This I don't. I'm an I, I'm an ideal listener. <laughs> <laughs> but that, but that, but the the sort of the real key point here, and the thing I need to stress: do, do you do you understand, uh, or do you think it's clear the difference between like this thing is not grammatical, and uh, and therefore you need to use extra words to be able to convey it. Oh yeah, I understand the difference between so, grammaticalization and periphrasis. Cool. Okay, because again, a lot of people had a problem with that. Like they saw that that wasn't allowed, and then a lot of people were like, "Well, how the hell could you say that?" But if if I've made it kind of at least somewhat clear that you know, just because it's not grammaticalized doesn't mean that you can't use extra words to get the same meaning. If that's clear, then oh we'll no, go- yeah. I, yeah, I understood that completely. I just wasn't sure whether that thing sure. he said was general or it was specific. Sure. I'll ask people already and see what he says, but uh, as far as I'm aware, it's it's specific. Um, yeah. Now. Uh, that's that's one thing. The, uh, oh, do you have another thing to add? Uh, no, that was it. Cool. Uh, another thing that just popped into my head, and I did it wrong again just there. Apparently, or not even apparently, the word periphrasis is not pronounced periphrasis, and this blew both me and Biberidian's mind. It's, it, it's hold on, hold on. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. Okay. <laughs> periphrasis. Uh, peripherous. Peripherous. Perifer- Peripherous. Ah, oh, yeah. So I didn't. I didn't see the the so, or I forgot how to interpret the the stress marker there. Peripherous. It's weird. So, it's so difficult to pronounce, and apparently that's the correct pronunciation. And I have heard, never heard anyone pronounce like that. Everyone I know says periphrasis, and I think it's because if if the word periphrastic is pronounced periphrastic, but it's ah oh, here. Yeah, but it's peripherous or whatever the hell. And I'm just like, and do you know what? I'm actually shunning that. I'm like, I don't care. It's periphrasis. It's just let's make that a thing because that that word periphrasis is so uh, difficult to pronounce. It's awful. Look at looking at Wiktionary anyway. It says periphrastic, not periphrastic. It's oh. it's an it, not an e. The second oh, vowel. Oh yeah, no, sure, but it's not it's periphrastic. Not, it's not peripheristic. The stress, the stress is on the third syllable in, in per- periphrastic, yeah. Right, yeah. So like, I, I, I getting vowels wrong in the middle. I'm sure it happens, but it's it, this is all about the stress sort of thing. The stress, I, yeah. Down with that. And stress. It's both for me. <laughs> you what? It's both for me. I'm 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 shocked by both of them. I I I'm just down with that stress. Like that stress, I don't want that to exist. I from this point on, I'm petitioning that the word periphrasis become norm. Like everyone says, anyways, and this perifer periphrasis nonsense should be banned. <laughs> like it's just, it's just so awful. And now that I know this, I listen back to the video, and I'm like, every time we say periphrasis, it's just wrong. Um, it's not wrong. So I just wanted to point it out. No, it's not a big deal because I don't pr- pronunciation errors are not a big deal in my bag. As long as we can understand what we're talking about, I don't care. Uh, but it's just I've never had so many people pronounce it so wrong and it's, no it's, one knew. it's not wrong it's just it's just different we we have no truck with prescriptivism <laughs> on this podcast <laughs> yeah exactly well no actually no i'm going to be pres- prescriptive here i'm going to prescribe that it's periphrasis and that's it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and then, so uh, last thing on, on the uh, Tensastic Mood and Oa, or not even on that, but inspired by it. Um, I think it's pretty clear that I'm going gung-ho with the collaborations at the moment. Yeah. Because um, there's a lot of, there's, there's really good new YouTubers springing up, and I really want to, like, help them out. And also, just, I just want to work with people, because it's a lonely career sometimes, this, this YouTube thing, outside of this podcast with you, Bill. Um, I am now kind of uh, at my end with collaborations like i don't know of any other creators uh that aren't like mega mega huge there's a lot of like mega huge channels that i could work with so i wanted to put it out uh does anyone have any suggestions of people i could potentially reach out to um sane suggestions like everyone's like david peterson like i would never I'm never going to be able to work with David Peterson. Like he's too busy off doing Game of Thrones, right? So if anyone has um, an idea of you know similar YouTubers of similar similar size channels, uh, drop them in the subreddit and I'll, I'll go investigate. I'd love to. I'd love to find out some more. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and that is uh, that's all I have to say about tense aspect and mood. <laughs> Finally, after like nine months of doing videos on verbs. Um. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm really happy to see like more oa as always 
Yeah, every everyone was saying that, but I, I need again. I need to stress this. Always, like it's never my intention to make the linguistic section of of artifacts even be like, here's my conlang, here's what I'm doing with it. Oa only gets wheeled out if it if it serves an educational purpose. Um, like in this oh, yeah. instance, it was a great way of summarizing the information in the previous three um, uh, videos on verbs and showing how to put in in action. Um, and a lot of people are kind of like make more of videos where you just talk about what you're doing with Oa, and like that I'm not doing. Like it's not a language; it's 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 a it's a demonstrative tool. Um, and if a point is better furthered by Oa co- popping up, then great. If it's if it's not, then I'm just going to resort to normal uh, sort of, you know, here's a survey of like languages or whatever, or let's talk about features yeah. or something like that. Um, that's an important thing. Uh, I just want to point out. Yeah, but we like it. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I do too. I do too. But again, just need to put on record. Our, the conlang thing is not a, here's what I'm doing with my conlang. That's not the purpose of Artifexian. Uh, it's educational, not showing off one's work. <laughs> Green, green room, the room of greenness, the emerald chamber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, last Pay week, no attention last... to the handsome podcasters behind the curtain. Oh, Bill said I'm handsome. <laughs> Anywho, uh, so last, uh, last month, uh, you told us all about your adventures in South America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we didn't get a chance to do Bank of Artifacts yet. And I would like to do that now because, uh, as always, I am incredibly grateful to the people who ship money to me from around the world. And I don't want it to go uh, un- unnoticed and unnoted. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, so, first things first, before I actually, I sent you a link um, in the Google Drive earlier of a map. Um, this is going to be on the website if anyone wants to check it out and in the show notes. It's essentially just a map of all the countries that I have received money from. Um Oh, cool. And over time, I'm going to try and scratch the entire thing off. Uh, so have a look at that. Head on over. And if you happen to have, uh, I don't know, like, say, Mexican money or something, and you uh, feel inclined to, like, want to help out the Bank of Artifexia, yeah, uh, please do. Um, it would mean a lot. And we'll, we'll talk about you on the show, and you'll get a bit, you'll get a bit of airtime. Um, so have a look at that, yeah? Yeah. Now, we received... Uh, I received... At loads of money um, from uh, people who want to be anonymous. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna thank them anonymously. Just like thank you for uh, for what you gave. It it really means a lot. Um, I won't go into more detail because they did specify an anonymity. Um, a person who did not specify anonymity is a friend of the show, uh, Cool Mayor. Oh. Uh, cool mayor of uh, Artifacts in Code of Arm Fames, which will hopefully be on a T-shirt uh, sometime soon. Uh, who gave uh, the bank of Ar- gave to the bank of Artifacts yeah, five Zimbabwean dollars, a and two South African rand notes, one from the nineteen seventies, and one from two thousand eighteen. So a bit of history there. And again, I am so appreciative when people give money that is no longer in circulation because that's like. That's valuable. Like, and people are mm. actually giving me something valuable, which is stunning. And like, I do not take that lightly. And thank you so much, uh, Cool Mayor, for for uh, for sending it over. You can check uh, the show notes. You can go check them out. I particularly find the South African money fascinating because you can see in the seventies that it's like uh, there's colonialism going on there, and then in the two thousand eighteen one, it's just a completely different vibe. And you can really like see the history of the country. In these two yeah. notes, these two items, and it's just fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. I wonder who that is on the one round note. Let's find out. Uh, he looks like standard antiquated white dude, to be fair. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's, it, that is that is some 1600s ass stuff. <laughs> Run of the mill 1600s stuff. Um, okay, it looks like it was Jan van Riebeck. Jan van Riebeck, what what did he do? Uh, Jan, Johan, this is a great name. How do you pronounce this? <laughs> Johan Anthonisun Jan van Riebeck was a Dutch navigator and colonial administrator 
who arrived in Cape Town and what then became the Dutch Cape Colony of the Dutch East India Company. So, you know, like East India Company colonial dude. Um, a if, if that wasn't clear bad enough from egg, the note, most likely. Hmm? If that wasn't clear enough from the note as was as is. <laughs> yeah, but just you know specifically. <laughs> um, yeah, that looks very much like him, and he was on. All he was on the obverse of all of the uh, South African banknotes from 1961 until oh wow 1992. So I guess the the entirety of the the apartheid era. I I I'm not great with my dates in, in South African history, so yeah. <laughs> well, it ended it ended in the early 90s, right? Uh, oh, and sorry, I should say actually for people who who are just listening. Uh, so there's oh, no, this... it's sorry, not not the entirety. Sorry, the the apartheid started in forty eight, and the the first series of notes was issued in uh, sixty one. So okay, uh, yeah, most of the apartheid era. Sorry, go on. No, that's okay. Uh, for people who are just listening and aren't going to look at the, the picture in the show notes, uh, the nineteen seventy South African note features this dude we just talked about. And then in stark contrast, the 2018 uh, note features Nelson Mandela. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why that's what it, what it meant by you can see the history of, of South Africa in these two items, which is South Africa in these two items, which is amazing. Um, so anyway, the, the letter, uh, first of all, a couple of things here in Kulmer's letter. Kulmer has some beautiful handwriting. Holy God. <laughs> like, I usually find it really hard to read um, cursive uh, script. Um, but this is great. This is beautiful and legible. It's wonderful. Um, he thanks us for the show. Um, and he thanks us at length as well, which is lovely. Um, and just, we appreciate it. Um, he says, he makes a comment that I don't like the word community, which I need to just put on the show here. I, I have no problem with the word community. Uh, my whole thesis around this is context is everything. So if a big um, company says that, oh, you know, you're in the Apple community if you buy our most expensive laptop. That's a terrible use of the word community and it's disingenuous. But if like, if people want to say that they're part of the art of vaccine community, that's, that's totally fine. Like, I'm not going to be all like, don't use that word. But if, and, if, and similarly, if we ever abuse that word to, you know, make money, then that becomes terrible. It's all about context, I think. Um, so yeah, that's that thing. Uh, they say that uh, Kumar says that um, they couldn't send a currency from their con world um, <laughs> because it's largely a, like a barter thing, and you might you know you might wear your wealth in terms of, like gold rings and like um, necklaces and armbands and that sort of thing. Uh, and again, my response to that is, I I think you're not trying hard enough. I would love to receive a gold armband in the mail. Uh, so <laughs> heads up to future uh, future people who want to send stuff in. Um, what else? They have extra information uh, about the notes on a um, a blog post they made on Tumblr. I will link that. Go check out Kumer's stuff. Um, Kumer's blog is brilliant. Oh, cool, cool, exactly. So it's endorsed by Bill, folks. Go check it out. And then finally, yeah. uh, they ask, they say, good luck with swimming. And good luck with your trip uh, in South America. So we already know the South America thing. The swimming thing, really quickly. Bill. Mm -hmm. Swimming is strange. (laughs) It's hard. Swimming. So I went to, so I'm going to lessons. For people who who don't know, I'm going to swimming lessons every Wednesday morning. I go take swimming lessons for 45 minutes, right? Day one, I show up and the instructor is like, okay, I need you now to put your head under the water. And while you're under the water, blow out. And I looked at her and went, are you crazy? And she's like, she looked at me and she was like, no, like put your head in the water and blow. And I'm like, you want me to open my mouth under the water? Like I thought we hold our breath when we're underwater. And she's like, no, if you do that, swimming is borderline impossible. You become fatigued straight away. You have to learn how to lit- literally breed whilst putting your head in and out of water. And that I find so difficult. Like every week I struggle with it. She's always like, you're not breathing correctly. You're not blowing out enough. You're not, uh, you're not taking in air correctly when your head's out of the water. It's so hard. Uh, to the point where I actually think that I may never be a good, a, a, a swimmer at all. Like I just cannot, I cannot get my head around it. 
Um, so that's what I think about swimming. Swimming is really difficult <laughs> and completely counterintuitive. Everything, my entire body is screaming, don't put your head in the water, it will kill you. And I have to try and fight that. And it's just, it's not working. Yeah, I, I have a similar problem. Um, and also, I, I find it really hard to pace myself. I just like, I kind of, I'm in the water and I want to just like get to where I'm going and not be in the water. And so I like swim very hard and like probably very inefficiently and get tired really quickly. Yeah. Um, whereas if I was able to just like relax a little bit, it would go a lot more smoothly. Yeah, for sure. I, at the start of the lesson now, she has us do like, I think it's like six lengths of the pool um, in, uh, ver- in various assortments of different strokes and stuff. Now we have flippers on our feet, so, you know, um, oh, okay. that makes it a fair bit easier. Uh, but still, by the end of like uh, lap two or no, not lap, lap four, maybe I'm like, I'm shattered. Like I can't, I can't do it. I'm going too hard and I'm not breathing. It's crazy. Um, and it's really sad because like the reason why I'm doing this is to try and ultimately to do a triathlon. And sure, if I never get the swimming t- thing down, if I'm just not good at it, I'll never do a triathlon, which is really sad. Um, mm. But hope- hopefully, hopefully it'll work out. I figure, I figure it can't be impossible to learn it as an adult. It'll be grand. I'll just need to keep, keep positive and be fine. Um, yeah. So that is this month's Bank of Ireland Effects. Thank you so much for everyone uh, who, who sent in stuff to the anonymous people. And thank you so much to Cool Mayor. Go check out the map. Go check out the notes in the show notes and go check out Cool Mayor's blog. Um, unless you have something to add there, Bill, uh, we can talk about the next thing if you want. Um, yeah, I've nothing in particular to add. Let's let's move on. I'm sorry again to everyone. This is very Edgar heavy, and I know we all love the dulcet tones of Bill, but you know you all have to live with what what it is. Um, <laughs> so I was talking to you off air, Bill, and I was saying that I DM'd. My first game of D&D last night. Excellent. And you were like, oh, I'll talk about it on the show for sure. Uh, now, I don't know what you want me to talk about here. So do you want to throw questions at me? And Because like, it, was, um, it was good. It was fun. I never realized um, how much work a DM has to do. And because of that, I am extremely thankful to previous DMs, your, yourself included, for doing all that work that I never realized you had to do. Um but yeah, and it was yeah, it was it was great. That's that's basically the summation of it. The the peek behind the curtain is fun, isn't it? When you realize just how much there is. Um, so, what rules are you using? So i I am using five uh, e, um, the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. I am not doing peso, uh, peso, um, largely because well, one, you told me that it's fine to go with five e, and also. Uh, I wanted to get the starter set. Like, I didn't want to have to create my own thing. I wanted to, you know, ease myself into this DMing thing. And yeah. uh, the only starter set available was the 5e one at the shop. And I didn't want to wait mm-hmm. for them to order it in. So I just I just got that one. That's fair. And, it, they, um, and the rules make sense. I don't think there's anything stupid about it. Like, everyone... Cool. I, I, I don't really know about the culture, though, but I remember people being very upset with D and D back in back in the previous versions, but this version seems cool. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people didn't like the fourth edition, right? Um, and they didn't like the particularly the change from three to four or from oh. three point five to four. And a lot of the three point five people went with Paizo and and started playing Pathfinder, mm-hmm. which is a little bit closer. But now P- Paizo are, are relaunching Pathfinder second edition, which is uh, I think meant going to be quite a different rule set. So. That will be interesting to see what happens there. Did the Pathfinder um, people not explicitly say that they weren't going to change things? Pardon me? I thought I thought the Pathfinder people were like explicitly said like Pathfinder exists because everyone loves 3.5 and it will remain like this forever. No. Oh, I thought they did. I'm pretty they sure. They never said forever anyway, but they, they okay. wanted to like keep reasonable continuity with the, the 3.5 rule set. And, you know, it was... Broadly, it was possible to to convert things. They kind of streamlined some stuff, and I think they've streamlined stuff a bit further. Okay. Um, for and they and they've made some other changes. I'm not really familiar with the 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 play test for second edition, but um, so what did you do in your first session? What, who your like what what characters did your did your players play? How many players did you have? So we had, again, we're following the starter set and in the starter set, oh, it's called, the adventure is called The Last, the Lost Mine of Fandelver, I think it was. 
Um, cool. And in the starter set, all the characters are pre-rolled, which is great, great because I didn't need to learn how to do all that crack. I could just focus on being a DM. Um, mm-hmm. So we had four players, which is the minimum you need for this, apparently. Um, we had a fighter, a human fighter, another human fighter, uh, one being the story being that the, the former uh, was like a noble, like a rich person, um, and the latter was like a commoner. Um, then we had a half elf wizard and we had a halfling rogue. Um, and that was the, that, those were the combination of things. Um, the, the way the story went, this spoilers, spoilers from now on in for, for this adventure. So stop now if you don't want it spoiled. Um, we, the basic shtick is that there's this dwarf, uh, who gives you a job. Uh, to do you are in the middle of doing that job and you figure out that he's been kidnapped and in the course of trying to investigate that you come across like a goblin lair and you you clear out the goblin lair and so we got up until the point of clearing out the goblin lair um and it was great it was great crack and uh, just but they the players did not do what i thought they were going to do and they they threw so many curveballs at me and it was really yeah it's really challenging to try and like pivot really quickly uh, to like not make it look like, because you don't want to make it look like to them that they did something in quotes wrong. You want to make it look like it's just a natural unfolding story. So when we got to this, this lair, this goblin lair, they were meant to go through the entire dungeon and like discover bits of the story before getting to like the big bad in the final cavern. But the way the layer is set up, there is a potential to shortcut the entire dungeon. So in the first room you get to, you can shortcut to the big bad, except it's really difficult to do. Uh, but the players, <laughs> like, they didn't... I tried to hint that it was really hard and dangerous to do, but they just didn't go for it. And they shortcut it right to the big bad, completely unprepared. And it was utter chaos, but it was really fun. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> players will do that. Yeah, and it's mad. And it's like... Because the way, again, the way the story is laid out, um, what, as I read it as a DM, I'm like, okay, I see what you've done. Like, this is the next logical progression from where mm-hmm. they're at. But players will just, like, logic to one person is not logic to another person. And they'll just, they'll just, like, come up with this line of reasoning that makes perfectly reasonable to go climb this really dangerous, like, feckin' wall or whatever. And, yeah, it's just, it's just nuts, like... Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. 